This is Report to Wyoming. This show targets local issues that matter right here in Natrona County, where we talk to real people about their thoughts and ideas. The Casper Fire EMS dropped by the station so we could chat with Public Information Officer Dane Anderson. We act about call volume for service, spring versus summer fire hazards, and then get into the emotional aspects of the job, both concerning victims of fires and other accidents and how the agency responds to them, but also how they themselves handle the emotional toll of a high-pressure, high-stress job. And then we get into family and personal life, which is always a pleasant reminder that our firefighters and EMS staff are real people with families and hobbies, just like me and you. The last time we talked, you were recovering from an injury, Uh right? And now you're all better? I'm back to my normal job function, driving an operating engine three on C-Platoon. So that's been really nice to be back, uh, back in the station with the guys. So uh, fortunately, we did find a little bit of time during the day to come and uh, talk with you again and appreciate the invite to be back. So, are they parked outside just in case, spur of the moment? Yeah, my uh, and, and how this is going to differ from our previous recordings is my radio is here, um, and if we get a big deal, um, a very serious call, I should say, big deal is more jargon for the uh, a serious call for service. I'm just going to have to leave so and hop on that fire truck and drive it somewhere. So that's okay. okay. I totally understand, yeah. and we can just pick up whenever you have time. Sure, splice them together. Okay, but this means no more throwback Thursday. I don't want to say no more throwback Thursday for right now, but it's still definitely a possibility in the future. But for me to uh, fill that in, even if I'm working on a Thursday, which I'm not anymore, um, I'm working that 4896 schedule where it's 48 hours on, 96 hours off. So I go to, I, I have my days off, my four days off. And if I'm not working a Thursday, I, I'm, I'm not working. So. Um, not to say that nothing's going to happen. I mean, if we find time and we find content, we'll put it up for sure on, on the socials. But uh, right now it's just kind of learning, getting back into the groove and swing of things for us and figuring out our direction from there. And so I think I saw on one of your posts that you're almost out of pictures and then some more resurfaced. Is there any shortage of the old pictures or did you pretty much get them all? I don't know. <laughs> I, okay. and, and to your point where it's like I thought I was running out of some pictures uh, to feature on the Throwback Thursdays during that temporary assignment. And then I found some more. That's why I say, I don't know. So I, I could say, yeah, we're out of pictures. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to stumble on a filing box somewhere or someone is and say, hey, look at these. Have you seen these before? And that's kind of the magic of it. Oh, wow. And then has anybody submitted their own photos? I uh, haven't got any submissions of old photos or anything to my knowledge. Not to say that they're not out there for sure in various publications, but I haven't seen very many come back, come back that way. But as we look in desk drawers, as we look in uh, old books and everything like that around our fire stations, I'm sure something might pop up that would be cool to feature. And so what does this mean for the public information officer role? Are you guys rotating? How does that work? Right. So the way our public information is scheduled right now is we try to maintain one on-duty public information officer at all times. So what that means in my capacity is for uh, yesterday and today, all those 48 hours, any responses from our department for general information, working with media members, uh, that that falls directly in my lap um, first. And then if I need some more help, then I'll, of course, call my chief officers um, get get what I need from them, or if they want to uh, take on this particular question or assignment, they, they certainly can based upon that. And then when I go off duty tomorrow morning, the A platoon public information information officer, firefighter Adam Mayers, is going to come on duty, and he picks up right where I leave off, and he'll be available for the 48 hours until um, until he goes off duty. And then B platoon public information officer, Engineer Toast Steinhoff will then come on duty and pick right back up to make, sh- make sure we have that seamless coverage. Is it mostly journalists bugging you guys, or do you get a lot of calls from the public too? Uh, it, it, it's a mixed bag of things. Uh, obviously, during, um, during times when we have higher, higher profile events, um, many times the public will call members in the media first, and then media members will call um, myself or send me a text message and say, hey, we got um, – a listener or a viewer or a, a reader tip that something is happening at this location. Do you have any more on that? And then subsequently I can provide the information. The story is built that way and the information gets out. Um, and then of course, respond, responding and providing context and sound information based off media releases for uh, those very high profile incidents that we proactively issue ourselves. 
that's how I interact. But yeah, general uh, general inquiries from the public, uh, general questions from the public, um, responding to social media messages. Uh, that that's all part of the job. Okay, very good. And I see there was an incident. Not it was high profile only because of the building it looked so bad. This right. was the radiators. Right. No, maybe it was a generator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Radiator. Yeah, know. it was on Monday morning. Uh, matter of fact, I was working an overtime shift, so I was actually on duty for this one, and. It came in as a as a smoke investigation where persons across the street of a commercial structure located on First and Beach Street saw a large amount of smoke. And then we got more callers on this reporting a loud bang followed by a large amount of smoke coming from the roof of a commercial structure. Clearly this meant, uh, well, we better start sending some folks that way. So we initiated a full structure fire response with multiple units and ladder truck company, chief officers, investigators. And when our units got there, they, they met with building maintenance who reported they were working on a, a diesel generator on top of the building that was just being really stubborn. But there was no fire problem there. They were trying to get a generator started. So anyone who knows what it's like to start a diesel that hasn't been started in a while, might be gelled up, you're going to get lots of smoke, lots of really strange noises, and that sort of thing. So um, credit to the public. That's a call for service. Let's see who this is. Call seven five one. And that'll be a call for service for Engine 1 right now. So they're still in, in station. They're still in service. So they're going to go handle that. I'm going to turn my radio down because I'm sure that blew something up. So. <laughs> People in their car. Whoa. Yeah. So, again, credit to the persons who called that that incident in on Monday. Seeing that smoke, it certainly didn't look like a structure fire. Everybody did the right thing, of course. But then it turned out just to be a stubborn generator. That was exactly one of those examples, too, where people were calling me. I was trying to get the 5 o'clock news up, so it was earlier than 5. But, hey, have you – do you know what's going on? There's a bunch of different, you know, agencies responding to this, and it looks like a fire. And so one of our one of our guys – you guys know him probably as DJ Nike – happened to be in the area. Yeah. I don't know if he stopped to talk to you, but he figured out that it was the generator mm-hmm. and just texted me. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going right. to go over there. But it was maybe a case of it looking a lot worse than it certainly it actually did, was. yeah. The last time we talked, you forecasted that 2023 would be a very busy year. Mm-hmm. We're only a quarter of the way through, but are we on track for a busy year so far? Yeah, I just, uh, a matter of fact, talking with my captain on the way over here, I, I was like, uh, hey, captain, when was, what's the last incident number that you recall seeing on a report? And um, to, his, to his memory, it was uh, around 3,700 uh, calls for service. Now, that number is a county-wide number, so all agencies fire EMS in our county. So if we uh, look at last year's number of about 8,800, and we're right at about a quarter of the way through calendar year right now. Um, let me do some quick math. Yeah, so we divide that by four, t- around 2,200 calls for service. So I would say that number is probably accurate to be right around 2,200 calls for service for the Casper Fire EMS department. So, um, yeah, we'll see what the summertime brings. Um, summertime historically does bring with it an increased number of calls per ser- for service per day. So um, we'll see. Um, without, well, people are slowly turning off their heating appliances uh-huh. and maybe less hearty stews on the uh, stove top. And at least for me, it's not warm enough to sit by a campfire yet. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not grilling. Is springtime your slow season? I would, uh, I would hate to quantify one season as a slow season. Um, springtime brings with it a lot of different dynamics, of course, than wintertime. I like to reference uh, Wyoming author's uh, Mark Sprague's book, Where Rivers Change Direction, when I think about this. When springtime comes in Wyoming, all of us Wyomingites, like, wander outside and kind of wonder what happened. Like, we're, we're just, like, what happened? The wind's not blowing. It's nice out. It's 50 degrees. It feels like it's 80 degrees to us. So with that, of course, we, we want to get outside. We're active people here in Wyoming. And when folks start getting outside and start doing activities that are now outside, it brings a different dynamic of emergency responses that come with it. So um, vehicle crashes, um, not necessarily attributed to black ice, but just a simple fact that there's more people on the road. Uh, different uh, instances of recreational hazards that come in, the swimming, the running, the out- outdoor recreating. Um, people are outside and experience emergencies outside a little bit more as opposed to being indoors. So while it's not necessarily a slowdown, it's just a change in more common things that we see. Okay. 
I was expecting <laughs> to be like, yes, we take advantage of this time when, <laughs> but of course, there's no such thing. But then you typically, the summertime, you see an uptick? Yeah. Um, historically, June, July, August have brought with them the most calls for service on average per day compared to other times during the year. Um, as to what that is quantified to, if somebody could figure that out, they'd be very rich. Um, you can question. you could spec yeah you could speculate on a lot of things of why we why we experienced increased calls for service is it more persons possibly sure taking advantage of the great Wyoming weather to come have um, come experience Wyoming in the summertime and not experience the winter I don't blame you is it more persons doing different things that are normal residents here could be um, is it more people uh, using outdoor heating appliances versus indoor heating appliances such as fire pits barbecue grills. Um, Anything that way could be. Um, so any one of those things, you can you can point to that and be like, yep, that's it. But there's no one particular reason why we have more calls in the summer rather than just people. More people are out doing more things. What about the 4th of July? Is right. that a particularly heavy day? It can be. Uh, it certainly can be. Um, it, in years past, we've um, we provided increased staffing for the sanctioned and uh, permitted fireworks events, such as the one at the, at the event center. So uh, we join a multi-agency effort up there to help with the um, permitted firework event, for sure. Um, as we know, fireworks are illegal in Natrona County to purchase and operate. Uh, but as we also know, that um, the, that rule isn't always followed. Uh, we would encourage everyone to please follow that rule, uh, that there are just do not purchase or set off any fireworks on your own during the 4th of July. would appreciate that very much. But then a lot of dynamics also come into play with the with fireworks in the instance. Um, we have had instances of fireworks that go into homes and cause, uh, cause problems there. So there's a hazard of having fireworks yourself is that once you light the firework, if it has a flight path, you can't control it. So um, please don't light fireworks again. But then also, if we have the hot and dry weather that comes with it, July is about that time where we start to the prairie starts to really turn that blonde color. The grass and the, uh, the, starts to dry out. We get those winds that come with it, and then with the hot and dry weather comes the hazard during the in the wildland urban interface. And what that is is when open fields come up against structures in Casper is the simplest way of saying that. And so, a person endeavoring to maybe light some fireworks away from a populated area means you're probably near an urban interface area. And if you have hot items in there, right combinations, you might experience instances of wildland fires. So, and that's not to mention either the uh, the medical hazards that come with having fireworks as well. So, I don't know, mixed bag. We'll see what to, um, this year's 4th of July brings. Oh, I know you don't have a crystal ball. Right. So I'm kind of picking on you with these questions, but... Do you, in your experience, um, know how these, like, wet springs affect the summer in terms of grass fire? Uh, Just, like, backyard grass catching on fire? Without possessing any sort of degree in range ecology or something like that, I would would say our best source for that would would be over at the BLM office here in Casper in the High Plains District. They'll have that answer. Anecdotally, though, uh, when we have wet springs and high snowpack springs— your grass is going to grow pretty well uh, over out on the prairies um, in your yards. Grass grows pretty well. It's going to green up really fast. And then depending on what weather was, is going to follow our spring wh- is going to either keep that grass a little bit higher in the moisture content or it's going to dry it out pretty quick. The problem with that fuel type um, and classifying those fuels as we call them in, in the wildland arena is that grass being very light and very – flimsy, it dries out much faster than, say, a very large Douglas fir tree. So um, we get more dynamic swings in fire behavior in those types of lighter fuels based upon the day-to-day weather. Now, as a whole, if we're looking at a very hot and dry summer as a whole, that's when we start to be concerned about those heavier fuel types, such as the lodgepole pines up on Casper Mountain. And then if we have patches of uh, aspen trees or Douglas fir, blue spruce, maybe in the urban interface, like how dry are those large trees going to get based upon the overall weather in the summer? 
So good questions to see. Um, the wildland firefighters around here, the BLM office does a really good job of working with the National Weather Service and then also taking samples of these fuel types throughout the summer to determine how, how are the fuels doing? What are we looking at for possible fire severity? And all those factors go into the burning restrictions. And then, of course, the weather uh, is tracked by the National Weather Service and red flag warnings are issued on days where fire behavior uh, w- may be extreme based off of all the elements involved. And I've heard a rumor that Casper Mountain is overdue for a fire. Can you speak to that at all? I, I don't know about um, overdue. I, I, I would... I don't want to see what that due date is, um, and I would hope that before an instance where something like that would happen, that um, landowners, property owners on, on the mountain have taken those steps uh, to prepare their properties um, for the threat of wildland fire that, that comes that way. So there's lots of resources out there on tips and tricks to uh, make your property, set it up the best the best way that you can. When you look back in history... Um, <clears throat> at the Jackson Canyon Fire and also the Sheep Herder Hill Fire, um, we have two ends of the mountain that burned. So we have Jackson Canyon that burned the west end of the mountain and came around that way um, down all the way to um, CY Avenue, which turns into Highway 220 there. So it burned right up all the way to there during the Jackson Canyon Fire. And then more recently, in 2011, we remember the Sheep Herder Hill Fire, which started um, over past, over, up and over by Crimson Dawn, and then uh, on that day, on September 10th, came ripping down that front end of the mountain and then just took off, fueled by some of the strongest summertime winds I think I've ever felt. Um, that was, I would, I don't think it's outside the realm at all to call that day a perfect storm. So I hope we don't get a day like that. Um, and I hope before that day, if that day does come, that the proper steps um, of those private property owners in the mountain have been followed and they've set themselves up for success to make their properties and spaces and their lives defendable for sure. Which leads me to my next question. One thing I haven't asked you, um, but I was wondering about is the role of kind of managing emotions. Mm -hmm. You show up and then typically someone's not having their best day. Sure. Um, It's how do you guys prepare yourselves for talking to people, empathizing, um, working with residents of a home who are just standing outside kind of wondering, is it going to, how much damage is this going to be? Right. Um, it's never easy to, and it, 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 it never will be easy to be speaking to somebody who is undergoing a tragedy that requires our response, be it a medical problem, um, a, a, like a vehicle accident or a fire problem or something like that, where we have to show up. As we've talked about before, um, when a person calls 911, that is a very powerful thing. They have admitted to themselves and the people around them that this problem is outside of my own capacity to solve. And Wyomingites being, I think, very self-reliant, very hardy people who are typically used to solving their own problems, fixing their own things, making things better themselves, it's a powerful thing, certainly. Um, The thing that we focus on, number one, is the well-being of people. Are you hurt? Is your family hurt? Everybody here, are you guys okay? Stuff can be bought again. Stuff can be rebuilt. There are resources out there, and we immediately, during a tragedy, make those resources available and known to the person who is undergoing this problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. But listening is, is, is going to be um, something that we endeavor to do in those instances because everyone's particular problem is going to be different and subjective to their situation being an active listener, understanding what they need based upon what we have right there, and then providing every resource we can to help them in those first seconds, minutes, hours following the incident can, uh, is critical for the long-term success and setup after that. So listening, and then um, we're people too. Firefighters are definitely people too. When we show up to incident scenes, we are very highly trained to take immediate, swift, and decisive action that on the surface looks very unemotionally involved um, because emotion in the act of mitigating an emergency scene doesn't really do a service. That said, immediately afterwards, we are people um, who respond to this, just like your officers are people too, who respond to law enforcement issues, just like your EMTs and paramedics who respond 
are persons too. Your telecommunicators who take that phone call are people too. So we we don't lose that human element either. So understanding that you are also a human being who is helping a human being and keeping that perspective can also aid us when the immediate threat has passed and we begin the phase of, all right, how do we help you now? Now that the threat is over, this thing just happened to you and we're here for you. So that just keeping all that in mind and then adapting into each situation as it comes is probably the best way to do it. Is there a perfect way? Probably not. So this is such a high stress environment a lot of the times. What services do you guys have or resources for mental health and kind of making sure that the firefighters are okay? Over the past couple years, we have um, we have really shown a very bright light into the corner of mental health in our responders here in Casper. Um, this has unfortunately been reactive to um, some unspeakable tragedies, but also in response to those and being react- being reactionary to that, we realize that now we need to be proactive. So uh, the number one thing that we have just recently rolled out is that, <clears throat> excuse me again, is our responders here in Casper, our officers and firefighters, and the city of Casper employees have access to a Cortico app on our phones. Uh, the app is free to download for any of our employees, and then there are specialized applications for law enforcement members and for firefighters and EMS members as well. Uh, this application does a lot of things. Um, it can it can connect you right away to a peer support team member, the, and a peer support team member is a member, a firefighter just like yourself, or an officer or deputy just like yourself that has undergone some training. Um, not necessarily to be a mental health practitioner or a, cl- or a clinician, but undergone training to be a receptive and an active listener to understand what um, what a person might be going through. Also, with the context of I'm an emergency responder myself, I've been there. So, um, and that first step and having that available all the time via an app where all you got to do is just tap a couple buttons um, to have that immediate access is definitely a game changer and a valuable resource for every responder that we have in the county. And then after that, as we go down into the treatment for this mental injury incurred in the line of duty and then recovery thereof and coming back to work, uh, that application also gets those right resources for that person dependent on the situation because every responder, what they're going through is not going to be, again, exactly the same thing every time. There is no one plug and play solution. So having those multiple options available, figuring out which is the best way to heal this mental injury and returning our officer, our firefighter, our medic to work, that's a, that is the focus. So the app is a good first step and utilizing it thereof is going to be critical going forward. And everyone's encouraged to do that for sure. Is there anything you do particularly like housekeeping, but your mental health kind of little things just to make sure that you're staying sane and... Lowering stress? Uh, staying sane, lowering stress. I, I try to, um, when, I, when I go off duty, uh, there, there, there's a lot of things. When, when I go off duty, I, I definitely am off duty. It doesn't mean I'm not a firefighter when I'm off duty. Uh, in the public safety field, you are so highly trained. It becomes such a part of your life. Um, and in particular, in the fire service, when we talk about that, I spend a third of my adult life um, actively being a firefighter, working with other firefighters for sure. Like it or not, it becomes ingrained in your conscience. Uh, that said, you don't always have to be in the position of a responder all the time. So when you go off duty, you can be off duty. You can be aware of what's going on, or you don't have to be aware of what's going on. That's okay. You're off duty. If they need you back, they're going to call you back. I focus on enjoying my time at home. I, I focus on um, what my family's doing and I like I just like taking care of my house, being a homebody for sure. I like t- I like doing things and fixing things around the house, making it better for my family. Just very normal things that a person might do, and it's different for everybody. So it's like I say, everyone's got a thing, and every firefighter has a thing too that they do when they're off duty. And it's not for anyone to judge what your thing is. It's just you have a thing, and if you have a thing. Um, Take full advantage of it. To get the quality time, too. And yeah, to get the quality time, to get the separation, uh, to create a, a little bit of delineation in between of what we do instead of being constantly on all the time. So, 
And this is perfect because last uh, in the last episode we left off before we got to family time and how you kind of manage these separate lives almost. Well, like mm-hmm. you said, you're always a firefighter, but always, yeah. it's a very different dynamic. I'm mm-hmm. wishing, I don't know, but being at home has got to be totally different than being at work. For me, it certainly is. Yeah. And I'm managing a wonky schedule too. So there are certain things that I must do to make sure that when I am home with my kids, I'm really soaking it up because they're mm-hmm. only little for so long. Mm-hmm. And also mental health. What's your thing? What's my thing? Uh, gardening? I do like gardening. If I have the opportunity to bird watching. Are you going to the Warners? <laughs> my, my wife did send me the link for, <laughs> for the bird identification class at Warners. It looks really cool. I want to check it out, but uh, I've been doing fairly well with a pair of Leopold binoculars and then the Audubon guide oh, here. Yeah. So I just, if I see something I don't recognize, I'll, I'll, I'll just get the guide and get the binos. I'll glass it real quick and uh, and then see. The reason I like bird watching is it's, it's it's kind of a low maintenance activity. I fill up the bird feeders and I sit inside my house. So it's like, and then it's uh, shake the eight ball, see see what birds come by. So what are you getting? Coming my first house? season of bird watching, I believe, and I'm no means by an expert, very much a hobbyist in this, but I believe I identified 26 separate species uh, at my house in Southwest Casper. So uh, that uh, that's been fun. When I'm in the hardware store, letting the bird, letting the kids kind of look at the uh, different types of bird seeds and the suet cakes and. I asked the kid. I asked the kids, like, "What do you think the birds are going to want to eat?" And then they'll pick one, and it's like, "Yeah, let's give it a shot." Does it really matter? No, but they get to be involved in that and pick it and help fill up the bird feeder and everything like that. So, um, so yeah, it's been interesting for sure. We have so many different types of birds. We do. Yeah. This is, I'm, I need to go get some bird feeders. What about mm-hmm. a bird bath? Does it do anything for the birds? I, or is that kind of just superficial? I don't even know. Um, I. They have some really cute ones. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I would get one of those. I I don't even know. I might try it, though. I've just been trying to mix up my seeds and suet cakes. But I, I also like watching for the larger species that come by and when, and don't do that. So Remind me, how young is your youngest? I uh, My youngest is just turned two. And your oldest? My oldest is four and a half. Two and four and a half. Okay. So nobody's in kindergarten yet. No, but not yet. are you going to send your oldest this fall? I No, we're going to give him one more year. I think he'd be... My wife and I agree. It's a, he'd be a very, very young kindergartner. So mm. give him just one more year to hang out. And um, I hope he doesn't reference this one one day, pulls up this podcast 18 years from now. He's like, you should have started me earlier. But um, no, I, I think having him at home is going to be for the best. Okay. Or in preschool, I should say. Spending probably yeah. a lot of your days off hanging out with the kids and yeah. doing dad things. Yeah, for sure. Very normal. Mm-hmm. Okay. What do they like doing? And we got multiple viewings of Paw Patrol and Bluey. Disney movies are are a big hit for sure. It's been a little tough to get outside and get the kids playing outside because I have a 14-foot snowdrift in the back of my yard that hasn't quite gone away yet. Getting them outside, though, has been uh, something that my wife endeavored to to get us started with. And and having them outside a lot more has been, I think, just wonderful and beneficial when we get that. I did see we have some daytime highs in the 50s coming up over the weekend, so we're going to try to really get outside if we can even stand the wind even a little bit so very very simple stuff the the kids are intelligent they're inquisitive they like to help out with the projects so um just keeping up and with them as fast as they can grow that i mean it's probably gonna be something new uh when i come off work so we'll see what we'll see what that is do you guys get vacation we certainly do yeah the the dynamic with a firefighter schedule when they take a day of vacation uh, when a firefighter takes one day of vacation, they burn 24 hours of accrued benefit time. The advantage to this is this. With the schedule that we work, if we have four full days off and I want to take my two assigned shift days off, I do have to use 48 hours of my accrued benefit time, but that turns into 10 full days off. So, oh. right. There, so, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of Robin Peter to pay Paul, but at the same time, those are, are 10 solid days where you can be at home or you can pick wherever in the world you want to go, throw a dart at a map because you got the time. All right. What about this survey? So a couple weeks ago, we launched a community feedback survey. Um, and this community feedback survey um, is being hosted by the fire department to – let anybody who has had an interaction with the Casper Fire EMS Department, either directly, indirectly, any opinion at all, um, your fire department wants to know your thoughts. Um, 
even if it, your interaction has been nothing more than waving at the firefighters as they drive by on the street, seeing us in the grocery store, anything like that, we want to know how the citizens and visitors that we serve feel about our fire department. What are we doing well? What are we not doing so well? We're looking for honest feedback. Uh, why that's important is as we forecast and as we plan for the future needs of the city of Casper, <clears throat> excuse me, our citizens, our visitors, um, and any of those dynamics that our citizens and visitors might bring and their modern problems that they're experiencing, we want to be ready for that. So this is a proactive step to let our public um, give us the feedback that we're seeking. It's a very, very simple, short survey. Um, the link, if you want to go online, of course, you, it's pinned to the top of all of our social feeds. So being looking for the survey at the top of our social feeds, if you're, if you're a social media user. If you're not, you can go onto the Casper Fire Department website. That's casperfire.com. Now, it's going to redirect you over to the city of Casper's page and then our page uh, subsequent to that, right underneath our mission statement, you'll see uh, when you land on the page, you're going to see a, a black and white picture of our ladder truck and some firefighters. You'll see our mission statement. And then right below that, you'll see our community feedback survey. And my advice is this. If you can hear my voice, we want to know your opinion and we want that feedback. The survey is if you choose 100% anonymous, you don't have to leave your name. You don't have to leave any contact numbers. But we want your feedback nonetheless. Now, if you want to talk with a Casper Fire EMS firefighter about what your survey, about what you put in your survey, about your concerns, about something that, you know, has been just a question or something that's bugging you, anything like that, you can put your name and contact information in there and then we'll give you a call back. So, um, and then get a time to really talk with you and uh, drill down to what is important to you as a person, as a citizen or a visitor. Oh, this is awesome. I love it. That's a big task, though. It, but it's a massive, massive it. task, but we need to know what our citizens need as we go into the future. Um, and we need to be ready to be proactive and responsive to those needs. And the best way to figure that out is simply asking the question, what do you need and how can we help? This has been Report to Wyoming, presented in the public interest by Town Square Media.